One man told his friend, my wife and I had words last night, but unfortunately, I didn't get to use mine. I read in a book one time that psychologists state that girls tend to marry boys that are just like their fathers. I think that's the reason why mothers cry at weddings. A woman was complaining to a marriage counselor about her husband, said he's the most self-centered man on the face of the earth. The psychologist said, well, give me an example of his self-centeredness. She said, that's easy. He said, he won a trip to Hawaii the other day for two, and he went twice. <laughs> there was a Mexican man who went into a restaurant in Louisiana, and as he was drinking a cup of coffee, a redneck came up behind him and hit him. He said, ha! He said, that's karate from Korea. And the Mexican man picked himself up off of the floor and left, came back just a few moments later and found the redneck, and he hit him in the back of the head and said, ha! He said, this is a crowbar from Sears. So you don't need witchcraft to get even. You can get, you can get even with a cookie. Story is told of the blind man who was being led across a thoroughfare by his dog. The dog laid down in the middle of the street. Just as the blind man saw the traffic coming, he said, get up dog, you're gonna get me killed out here in the middle of all of this street. Here come all of these cars, get up. And the dog failed to get up. A good Samaritan standing on the adjacent corner saw the circumstance, came over and helped both the dog and the blind man to the next side of the street. And the blind man began to fumble in his coat pocket for a cookie. And when the good Samaritan saw him fumbling for the cookie, he said, you're not going to reward that worthless dog for failing you, are you? And the blind man said, no, but I do have to locate his head before I can kick his behind. I want to tell you about a pastor who'd been pastoring about 40 years. And one Sunday morning on the way home from church, he said to his wife, he said, you know, you've never really said anything about what you feel about my preaching. He said, we've been married 40 years and I've been preaching all that time. And you've never indicated whether, you know, whether you think it's a good sermon or a bad sermon. And I just kind of got used to that, but I don't know. I'm a little curious uh, what, you, what you think about my sermons. And she said, well, uh, I've got a box under the bed at home that will explain everything. So he couldn't drive fast enough to get home. He was curious. And as soon as they got home, he went into the, to the bedroom and pulled out this little cardboard box that was just big as tall enough to slide under the bed and uh, there's an egg in one corner and a little stack of money in the other corner he thought boy this is this is something I don't understand this said what do you mean this box will explain everything uh, she said well every time you preach a bad sermon I put an egg in the box He's overwhelmed. Forty years and there's only one egg in the box. She said, and he said to her, but what's this stack of money over here? She said, well, every time I got a dozen eggs, I sold them and put the money in the box. <laughs> When I wasn't preaching in the service, I used to love to go back and, and uh, talk to the young kids in, in, in the uh, church. And we had this class of 10 to 12 year olds that I'd never visited and I wanted to go visit them. Now, I made up my mind what I was going to do. Uh, I was going to go and tell these kids, uh, let them ask me anything they wanted to out of the Bible. And just say, you can ask any question you want about the Bible, about church life, about what it's like to be a pastor, anything. And you know what? 
I didn't even pray. I didn't even pray and, and ask for God's help or anything. Why should I? I mean, what's a 10 to 12 year old kid going to ask you that you couldn't answer right out of the Bible? I mean, to tell you the gut level honest truth, I felt awesomely overqualified for the past. I just knew these kids were going to be so impressed with Pastor Jack and his knowledge of the Bible and be so grateful to have a pastor like that. You know, I knew I was going to win their hearts. And so we got them off the walls and seated and put a, heard it up into one spot and threatened them with an inch of their life to sit still. And then I said, you know, you could ask anything you want out of the Bible, just anything. Go ahead, kids. And uh, first little kid raises his hand and he says, Pastor Jack, Pastor Jack. He said, this has been bothering me so much lately. He said, I don't understand. Why is it? How, why do bad things happen to good people who love God and are trying to follow him? <laughs> that was the first question. Of course, he's asking about the problem of suffering and evil and my mom was racing through the Bible and I thought, well, Job, you know, and so I started to say, give him Job's story. But, you know, God never really tells us why he let all that happen to Job. Why did he let Satan do it? Why was it important to show Satan how righteous Job was? So that really wasn't an answer. I mean, theologians have been struggling with that one for 2000 years. And last time I checked, no one's gotten an answer. <laughs> so I looked at the kid and I said, well, you see, when God created us, he wanted friends, not robots. And so he gave us the dignity of free choice. And when we exercise that in the wrong way, then suffering and evil come in and just kind of trailed off into even vaguer general theological axioms. <laughs> and I looked in their little eyes and I could tell they weren't impressed with that one at all. <laughs> Next kid shoots his hand up. He says, he says, he says, why did God create the devil? I want to see Ezekiel 28 that talks about his creation, but it doesn't say why. <laughs> why did he create the devil anyway? I just... <laughs> so I looked at that little kid and I said, well, you see, when God created the earth, he, he wanted friends, not robots. And so what he did was he gave us dignity, a free choice, you know. And they were less impressed with that the second time. And that was the high point of the evening. It went downhill from there. It was like some demon from hell had smuggled a list of all the unsolved theological problems the last 2,000 years. And said, here kids, ask him these. We had them for two hours that night. After about 45 minutes, I went, I'm, I'm through. I decided I'd just retire from the theological question answering business. Except and when I announced I was through, one little kid would not stop waving his hand back on the back row, just as hard as he could. And I said, what? <laughs> little kid says, you know, I want to know what Noah and his whole family did when they were in that ark on top of the water for the whole year. Well, I'd had it. I went, that's easy, kid. They fished. <laughs> Little kid next to him shot up his hand. He goes, well, they didn't fish very long. I said, why is that? He said, they only had two worms. <laughs> I was resting this afternoon trying to prepare and uh, fell asleep 
and had a very unusual dream. And I dreamed that I was in heaven. It's a good place to be. And as I was walking around looking at different things, the Apostle Peter came up and we began to talk together. As we were walking and discussing things, I looked out in the distance and who did I see but Miles Monroe. And he was with an ugly, ugly woman. <laughs> Wasn't his wife. And I said, Peter, what, what is this? And he said, well, you have to understand. He was a good man. And lived a good life. But right toward the end... He messed up just a little bit. And so, for throughout eternity, he has to be with this ugly, ugly woman. <laughs> and so we begin to walk a little bit further and walk down the streets. And who did I see but another good friend right here, Rick? <laughs> and he too was with an ugly, ugly, ugly woman. And I said, now God, explain this to me. Peter, tell me what this is all about. He says, well, you have to understand. He was a good man. But toward the end, he messed up. And so throughout eternity... He has to be with this ugly woman. And as I pondered these things, I walked further. And who but did I see my good friend, Brother Mark Sharona. Stand, Mark. <laughs> that gave us that word this evening. And as I looked at Mark, he was with a beautiful, gorgeous, voluptuous woman and it wasn't his wife and I said Peter what is this and he said well you have to understand she was a good woman <laughs> the story not long ago. The story goes that the Pope died and he went to heaven, was met at the gate by St. Peter, as these proverbial stories always begin. And uh, the Pope said, or, or Peter rather, said to the Pope, welcome, we're really glad you're here. He said, listen, by the way, before you go on inside, we have a little museum here of biblical artifacts of things that you might be interested in. As a matter of fact, we have the original autographa. We have the original autographs of scripture. Would you like to see that? The Pope said, well, yes, that would be great. And Peter said, well, look, I'll just stand here at the door of the museum. You go in, take your time, take all the time you want. Call me if you need me. So Peter's standing at the door. The Pope goes inside. He begins to pour over the original manuscripts of, uh, of the Bible. After a while, Peter hears this groan from inside. The Pope says, oh, no. After a few more minutes, it's a little more pronounced, a little more pained. The Pope is looking at the autographs. He says, oh, no. And finally, this wail of consternation. Oh, no. Peter runs inside and asks the Pope, what's wrong? What's wrong? The Pope is looking at the autographs. He said, the word was celebrate. <laughs> bus driver and a preacher died and both went to heaven on the same day. Bus driver was first, so he went first. Peter said, you were the bus driver. He said, I was. Peter said, we have just the place for you. And he took him to this great mansion up on top of the hill. Well, the preacher's thinking, ho, ho, ho. And suddenly, Peter comes back and says, you were the preacher? He says, I was. 
He said, we have just a place for you. And he takes him to this little shack down in the valley. The preacher says, just a minute. 40 years of my life I dedicated to preaching the gospel and helping people see the light. This guy was a bus driver. He gets a mansion, I get a shack. What's up with that? And Peter said, we understand that. But when you preached, people went to sleep. When this guy drove a bus, they prayed. I was desperately waiting on God after moving from Arkansas to California for a visitation of the Lord. God had said to me, I want you to minister. I want you to encourage people. I want you to, 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 to speak to the church. I want to encourage the church. And what am I doing? God, if you'll just give me the 43rd confirmation I've been waiting for. So we just moved to Southern California. And I decide that I'm going to wait on God all night long one night. But not only am I going to wait on God, I decided to pick what manifestation I was going to have. <laughs> and I thought about it. And I thought something nice that will preach good later. Because I, I didn't have enough faith to, to pick the Jesus manifestation. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so I said, I, I, I tell you what, I want an, I'm going to see an angel. That's what I'm going to do tonight, an angel. I mean, that's not a big thing to ask. If they're encamped about us, then why can't I just like, you know, use one for a minute? I'm going to see an angel. So I, I'm, I'm praying all night. And I've been praying for nights. God, I want to see. I want to see an angel. This particular night was my last night. I'd made a, a stand. I had committed myself to the fact that I was going to have an angelic visitation that night in my life. And I don't care what he said, boo, how, howdy, I don't, didn't matter, I didn't care what, which, you know, particular realm of angels he was from, it just didn't matter. I would just take a little guy, I didn't care. So, so I'm at the, I walk out my door, I'd been praying in the house, so I decided to go to my car to pray. My car is my prayer closet. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm, going, I'm going out to my car. And immediately I'm thrown, thrown off Kelter because it's a real eerie night. And don't you, I hate to pray with those kind of nights. I mean, it's like where the wind is whistling and there's fog in the air and there's this mist in the air. It's just spooky. You know, your goosebumps have goosebumps. You just kind of, oh, you know, because you always pray with one eye closed and one eye open. Don't, don't lie to me. Everybody here does it. I know you do. You know those spooky, you feel this thing scratching at your back when you're trying to pray. You know, you're, you're opening, you know, and you turn a little light on. That was one of those nights. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I mean, it was so thick with fog that you, it was about a three or four foot visibility, about like this, visi about a three foot visibility. So I'm in the car. This is an honest story. I've not altered any of this. I'm in the car and I'm hitting my head against the steering wheel because that's as close to being a Hebrew as I can be. That's my wailing wall. So I, I, I'm doing the steering wheel and I'm saying, oh God, send me a visitation and God, I want an angel. And I open one eye and look through the fog. And I'm scared to death, but I'm waiting on God. I gotta have a confirmation. So about this time, I didn't know it, but the neighbor had this big old Persian cat that, that was sitting on the fence watching this fiasco. Now, I guess the cat has better eyes than me. So the cat decided to jump to the ground, but because of the fog, he had to hit the windshield before the cat hit the ground. So I'm saying, God sent an angel. When I opened my eye, I saw this furry thing flying through the air. And this cat hit the windshield so hard he went, Ow! and slid off the window. And I went, oh, God, a cherubim with hair. Oh, I mean, it scared me to death. I, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> it gets better. I'm determined to not be intimidated or frightened. So when I got my respiration back down, I said, Lord, I want an angel. I, now, Lord, now I'm not messing around. That was funny, but I want a, <laughs> I want a real angel, real one. So about this time, I prayed 10 more minutes, my wife, Rolls over in bed and I'm not there. She feels for me and she says, she thinks to herself, I wonder where Larry went. It's by one o'clock. And she decides to get up and find me. So she gets up and she puts on this long white nightgown. Ah, yeah, yeah, it's 
It's easy, it's so easy. This is the easiest story. Puts on this long white nightgown, and Rebecca's about, what, four, eight, five foot, something like that. She's short, Hispanic, Mexican background, you know. Kind of looks like an angel. Charlie's angel. But <laughs> she, she gets up and she goes to the house going, Larry, Larry, and she can't find me. So she said, he goes to pray sometime. Maybe he's outside. So she goes out the back door, kind of going, Larry. So I'm praying God send an angel. I want a visitation. She turns the corner of the house, and I got excellent peripheral vision. I can see here from here. I mean, I got good, I got, see, uh, three fingers, two fingers, one finger. <laughs> Five fingers. <laughs> It's really hard to fool smart Christians, I know. So she's saying, Larry, Larry, Larry. And in my peripheral vision, I see something white moving behind me. And I'm thinking my moment is here. So I'm saying, I'm saying, Lord, send an angel. And I'm watching this, and this white thing comes closer. My heart rate is pounding. I'm thinking, oh my God, now, I don't, now this is a part I'm not real clear on, but you can ask my wife, I don't know if she tripped, I don't know if she tried to find the handle, but whatever the reason is, she lurched, lurched forward and grabbed the handle of the car and pressed her face against the glass of the car. And she's saying, Larry, and when she did, all I can see is this white thing coming and this face, you, you ever see face against glass? You know, just, and this face against glass, and I went, I begin to scream. I mean, I screamed like a, a woman. I mean, I was screaming at the, in this false set of voice, and it scared her. And she began to scream. She backed up and began to scream. And I'm thinking, my God, I, I've, I've frightened an angel. Uh, I heard about a preacher who was so depressed that he decided to commit suicide. He went down to an Ace Hardware store and he bought a little aluminum boat. And he bought a can of gasoline, a bottle of poison, a gun, a rope some bullets and a box of matches. And he put it in the back of his four-wheel blazer, drove north of the city to the lake, put it all in the boat, rode out to the north shore where there was a huge oak tree and it had a big limb that hung out over the water. And he threw the rope over the limb, tied a hangman's noose and put it around his neck, tied the other end off on the end of the boat, took the can of gasoline, poured it all over him, drank the bottle of poison, put the gun to his head, set himself afire, and then he kicked the boat out from under him, hanging suspended in the air aflame. He pulled the trigger, but he missed the rope I mean, he missed his head and he hit the rope. He fell in the water, put out the fire. He swallowed the water and spit up the poison. And he said the next Sunday, he said, folks, if I hadn't been such a good swimmer, I'd have drowned. <laughs> out in West Texas, we got a little town called Kermit, Texas. It's about a block past resume speed and a flat panhandle. And they ain't got a tree out there, but telephone poles and oil wells everywhere. And they had a great well fire out there. And Red Adair from Houston, Texas, who is known, I guess up here you know who he is from Houston, that famous firefighter. They call them hell fighters. They go into the flaming inferno to put those things out of these multi-million dollar oil wells. Well, this fire got so big, CBS, NBC, ABC, and all the syndicated news people were out there covering this thing. And uh, they, with all the latest technology, Red Adair and his team couldn't get it out. And they had that whole fire and that well circled with all this multi-million dollar expensive equipment and technology. So the city manager secretary called a volunteer to fire department and they got down and they got these two old geezers riding a 1929 Dodge pumper truck. And this old truck comes screaming down with the siren down the road and it goes right out towards the fire. News media is covering the whole thing. Red Adair and all their guys in their red jumpsuits and Learjets, they're standing around, can't get into this thing to get it done. And these two old guys just go piling right in through the barrier, right into the fire, right into the flames, and they leap off of that truck and in seconds the fire's out. Why, wow, the media couldn't believe it. I mean, a, a 29 Dodge pumper truck and two old, two old timers sitting on that thing and this fire is out. And they walking out of that fire, smoke ascending from their hair and eyebrows. And the news media walks up to the captain of the volunteer fire department. He said, sir, we've never seen such courage and valor. Nobody, Adair and all of his men couldn't do what you guys just did in a few seconds. He said, there's a $3 million reward for this fire. What are you gonna do with this $3 million? 
And the old captain of the volunteer fire department shoved his cap back on his burned head. He said, son, the first thing we're going to do is buy brakes for that truck. <laughs> you who haven't met me before, I am the world's most unknown evangelist. And I need to apologize to you for not having a rotten testimony. <laughs> Some of you have such interesting testimonies, you know. You, you killed at least 20 people before you were nine. And <clears throat> I just want to apologize for not having killed anybody. <laughs> if it helps, my father was a Maori prince and the Maoris were cannibals and they used to eat people. But that's about it. Some of my friends have such interesting testimonies, you know, their faces were blown off and they play the piano by ear and keep their eye on you, you know. The so, I was just a nerd. But there are so many of us. No wonder The Revenge of the Nerds was such a hot movie. <laughs> so for those of you who, who feel the way I feel, I am working on another book. It's called The Cross and the Butter Knife. Most of us came, many of us got saved in the 70s where the beast was stamping people, you know, on the hand. And uh, there were many, many millions of books sold on prophecy. They talked about the mid 1980s, we were going to be out of here. And, and we didn't plan to marry, we didn't make any wills, uh, we didn't plan what we'd be doing in the next 20 years because we weren't going to be here. Bless God, we we're going to be out of here. And I told you about my friend who was making rubber hands for Christians. So that. <laughs> You know, you put this hand on when you went down, the beast stamped on the, the rubber hand and um, you could still buy and sell with this on, you see. But when you got home, you just took off the rubber hand and if the Lord came, your hand would go to hell, but you would make it. That thing there, so... I, I said to my friend Harold, if, if you ever sell any of those to anybody, they won't need a rubber head for when the beast stamps here because they'll already have one. I was telling, uh, some, telling Mike and a couple of others last night about a, a story I heard that I'm sure most of you would appreciate. Uh, how many have had any problems with environmentalists recently? Just if, you, if you're going to build, there's a hand back there. We, we, we call them tree huggers, you know, and <laughs> they're, con they're concerned about the snail darter and the, <laughs> the spotted owl and what's going to happen if the frog loses his environment and so forth. Um, but a, a man was brought before a, a, an environmentalist judge because he, he had killed and eaten a spotted owl, uh, which was very distrustful to the judge. And so the judge had already made up his mind that this guy was going to spend some time in jail. And so um, the guy pleaded with the judge. He said, could I just tell you why I did it? And the judge said, really doesn't make any difference why you did it. You, you're going to go to jail. And he said, but let me just explain. And so he gave him this long, sad story of, of being out of work and how his kids were hungry, how he had run out of his food stamp allowances and he was no longer qualifying for welfare. His unemployment had been out. And he said, my kids were hungry. I was hungry. I saw that owl in the tree. I shot it. And I ate it without any regard for the fact that it was going to be extinct. I, I felt like we were more important. 
And so the judge said, if you hadn't told me that story, you'd be in jail now. He said, but I'm going to suspend your sentence, and uh, I don't want you to do this again. He said, I promise you. And the judge said to him, I have a curious question. He said, what does a spotted owl taste like? <laughs> and he said, well, your honor, he said, it's somewhere between an American bald eagle and a California condor. <laughs> Then he went to jail. The first story is about a farmer who, um, who finally gets to court after depositions and long hearings, and he's about to approach this trucking company that he is suing because of injuries he incurred in an accident with one of their vehicles. And so they hired this really high-powered attorney. Back east, we call them Philadelphia lawyers. And uh, so the attorney begins his inquiry with these words. Mr. Smith, is it not true that at the scene of the accident you were overheard saying, I am feeling just fine, thank you? Mr. Smith said, he said, uh, I was on my way to the farmer's market. My own mule, Matilda, and I, we've been together for about 14 years, and we were commencing down the highway, and just kind of out of nowhere, this man just ran right through the traffic light and knocked my truck over and knocked me into a ditch, and my mule was on the side of the road. She was hollering bad. I knew she was hurt. I couldn't help her. I couldn't get up. He says, so a few minutes later, I heard the siren, and I looked up, and it was the state trooper, and he got out right by my mule, Matilda, and he looked at her for a minute, and he took his gun out and blew her brains out. And then he came over to me. <laughs> and he said, how are you feeling? And that's when I told him, I'm feeling just fine, thank you. <laughs> the other story I wanted to tell you is the story of a businessman who was a very heavy sleeper, and I can identify very much with a heavy sleeper. It's hard to wake up. And um, this man got on the train um, in New York City, it was one of those crack trains that went from New York City to Chicago, and they, and they do it overnight, with making a stop in Buffalo, New York, and then going on to Chicago. But the stop in Buffalo is middle of the night. This guy wanted to sleep, and he wanted to be refreshed, but he didn't want to miss getting off the train in Buffalo. So when he got on the train, he said to the, uh, to the porter, he said, look, it is very important to me to get off this train in Buffalo. He said, I've got a million dollar deal working, and if I sleep and miss it, I'm going to lose a lot of money. And so he tipped the guy 200 bucks, and he said, now look, please don't, he says, sir, I will get you off, I promise you. Well, when he woke up, he was in Chicago, and he was really angry, and he went looking for that porter, and he went up one side and down the other, and crisscrossed him, and did a really bad number on him. And, and, um, and then the porter never would answer him and he walked away. And so a couple of people looking on, they just felt really sorry for him. And he said, man, why would you take abuse like that? That guy was really angry. He said, if you think he was angry, you should have seen the guy I put off in Buffalo. <laughs> so elderly woman comes into the uh, vet's office and she's got this dog cradled in her arms that looks very obviously to the vet like he's dead. And so she said, sir, would you examine my dog? And he said, for what? And she said, well, I want to know if he's alive or not. He said, he's dead. She said, well, please, I, it, he may be not be breathing, but would you just check him? And so he put him on the table and he listened to his heart. And he said, this dog is dead, man. How old is it? This dog's 20 years old. He said, I'm sure he's dead. And so she said, is there any special checking you could do? He said, so he said, there's one more I think I know I can do. He goes to the side door, opens the door to the alley, picks up one of the cats that's out in the alley, brings it in and puts it on top of the table. And the cat walks around the dog's body three or four times, crisscrosses and walks out. And he puts the cat off the table and he says, this dog is dead. And she says, I can accept that. She says, how much did I owe you? He said, $350. She said, for what? He said, $50 for my examination and $300 for the CAT scan. I did my very first conference, it was on spiritual gifts and healing. And it was the first time I took my own team by myself doing my own conference. And one of the things I love to do had to do with words of knowledge. Because I love the way Blaine Cook would, would have people that had never had a word of knowledge 
get one and minister to each other. I thought it was a wonderful way of equipping, and I love to equip. So I decided that's what we were going to do. And it was a tense moment. It was, I think, our second meeting, and I said, you know, I think that God wants to release words of knowledge here tonight for those of you that have never had one ever before. And so I prayed, and nobody responds. Everybody's afraid. And I said, all right, come on. There's got to be someone. It's okay. Just take a risk. Trust me. And so someone trusts me, and they raised their hand kind of feverishly and said, well, I've got a, I've got a word of knowledge. I think it's hemorrhoids. <laughs> and I was trying to be very clinical. Well, how did you get that? Did, did, did you see it? Did you, uh, uh, it was impression? Did you, did you feel it? You know, it was a pain in your body. And, and, and this person, it's, it's a gal, she just kind of stuck. She, it's like, I don't really want to talk about this. Well, <laughs> it gets worse. Well, see, I, my problem, I didn't exactly know what hemorrhoids were. And... <laughs> I don't know if you're going to make it to the end of this. <laughs> I had already decided how the ministry was going to go. What the Lord told me, I thought, was that the person that had the word would pray for the person with the condition. So I said, all right, who's got the hemorrhoids? Nobody's hand goes up. I said, come on. This per this guy has stood up in faith in front of all you people, you know, and if you have this condition, if you don't, you don't, but if you do, you got to stand up. It's really important. And so finally, a guy on this side, he stands up. I said, great. All right. Now we, we, got, a, we got a match, you know. So, so I said, I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come over here and I want you... And I want you to lay your hands right on those hemorrhoids. And she's going, no way, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I, I said, come on, I'll help you. <laughs> this poor guy's ready to run out of the building. He's like this. She's like this. Everybody's like this. And I said, what's the problem? I'm the only one in the building that doesn't know about hemorrhoids. <laughs> and I'm still here to talk about it. Can you believe it? See, I thought it had to do with a sinus problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> And then you have someone that comes up to you and tells you what you've just done. <laughs> I often tell the story of this Jewish man who walked onto a bus and he saw an Oriental man on the bus and he went over and he gave him a knock on the head. The Oriental man looks at him and he says, why did you do that? And the Jew says, why? Because of Pearl Harbor. The man says, Pearl Harbor? I'm Korean. <laughs> to which the Jew says, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, it's all the same to me. And he sits down. Well, a few minutes later, the Oriental man comes over to the Jewish guy and gives him a knock on the head. <laughs> the Jewish guy says, well, why did you do that? The Oriental man says, because of the Titanic. <laughs> the Jew says, the Titanic? The Titanic sunk because of an iceberg. To which he responded, iceberg, Steinberg, Goldberg, it's all the same to me. <laughs> Here are actual announcements from church bulletins. Here's one. Don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. This afternoon there will be a meeting in the south and north end of the church. Children will be baptized at both ends. Thursday night, potluck supper, prayer, and medication to follow. If you would like a record of your thighs and offerings, please see an usher.
A bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. Uh, the secretary meant to type on the bulletin, remember in prayer the many who are sick in our church. One little small preposition change. Remember in prayer the many who are sick of our church. <laughs> service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a good chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> Thursday at 5 p.m., there will be a meeting of the Little Mothers Club. All wishing to become little mothers, please see the minister in his study. This one, I'm sure a secretary got fired over this one. In the bulletin it said, after the first hymn, turned, it was supposed to say, after the first hymn, turn to someone and say hello. Merely leaving out one letter, after the first hymn, turn to someone and say, hell. <laughs> spoke briefly, much to the delight of his audience. <laughs> the rosebud on the altar this morning is to announce the birth of David Allen Belser. The sin of Reverend and Mrs. Julius Belser. <laughs> For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. Or strange signs, for example. This sign was on the fence, the wall of a convent. Positively, no trespassing. Violators will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Signed, the Sisters of Mercy. Tuesday at 4 p.m., there will be an ice cream social. All ladies giving milk come early. <laughs> a collection from Sunday School Kids, who was Solomon. Solomon had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. <laughs> the, the Sunday School teacher says, what is a lie? A lie, the child said. A lie is an abomination before God and a very present help in times of trouble. <laughs> Sorry when the prodigal son returned. Answer, the fatted calf. <laughs> My brother had a speech impediment and he could barely speak. And one time that at our church, the pastor had some books, Bibles. He wanted the young man to go out and sell. They could make a little money, a little money for the church, to buy some pews. And so my brother came there in order to sell some of these Bibles. And he walked to the girl and he said, M -m 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 Miss, my, my name is a a a Amos J Johnston. And I, I would like to sell some Bibles. I'm a good salesman. He said, I tell you what I'm going to do now. I'm going to give you 10 Bibles. And you only have one week to sell them. If you don't sell all 10 of them in one week, you're out. Is that fair enough? Ooh, that, that more, 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 more than, than, than fair. My brother went out and two days he was back. He said, sir, I'd like to have about 20, 20, 20. Bible. He said, you sold all 10? Yeah, they're all gone. He gave him 20 more. He came back and two days later, he said, I, I, I need a whole case 40. This is a good, good, good business. I said, my God, he said, when I sold those, there were other guys there that spoke as if they were Harvard graduates and they weren't selling a Bible. So the pastor said, what's wrong with you guys? He said, this guy can't even speak 
His name, he's selling all Bibles. You guys haven't sold anything. He said, I don't know what he's doing. So call him in. Let's find out how's he doing. And so he brought him in. And my brother called him in. He says, listen, Mr. Johnson, I don't understand this. Uh, these guys haven't sold anything. You tell them this is good business. Ooh, ooh the best business I've ever been in. He said, well, let me. Could you just give us an illustration how you sell so many Bibles? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd be g g glad to, 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 to do that. He said, I just take, 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 take my Bible, and I go to the door, and I knock on the door, and then the, the, the lady comes to the door, and I just open my Bible, and I said, ma'am, would you like to buy a Bible, or would you just like for me to, to read it to you? Lawyers typically aren't funny unless by accident. <laughs> Case in point, the following questions from lawyers were taken from official court records nationwide. So these are actual quotes from lawyers in courtrooms. Here we go. Now, if you don't laugh really well, I'm going to stop. So here's the first one. And was that the same nose you broke as a child? <laughs> Take some of you a while, it's, it's a little soon after lunch. Now, doctor, here's another. Now, doctor, isn't it true that when a person dies in his sleep, in most cases, he just passes quietly away and doesn't know anything about it until the next morning? Here we go. Here, here we go. What happened then? He told me, he says, I have to kill you because you can identify me. And did he kill you? Here's a real deep one. Were you alone or by yourself? <laughs> this one I can relate to. Do you have any children or anything of that kind? <laughs> he says, I show you exhibit three and ask you if you recognize that picture. Mm, that's me. And were you present when that picture was taken? <laughs> Now, Mrs. Johnson, how was your first marriage terminated? By death. And by whose death was it terminated? <laughs> just a couple more. You just... Do you know how far pregnant you are now? I'll be three months on November the 8th. Apparently then the date of conception was August the 8th. Yes. What were you doing at that time? <laughs> We, we, won't, we won't go there. We, don't, we, we won't go there. This one says, so you were gone until you returned? <laughs> and last but not least, you say that the stairs went down to the basement. Mm, yes. And these stairs, did they go up also? Dr. Ed Cole entitled Maximizing Your Manhood. You know, as a leader in a family and home, this series will help you as far as... Oh, shoot! Shoot! Yeah, but one thing, one thing. You didn't take your kids. Oh. <laughs> I was looking at you. Oh, man, I gotta get a famous back up again. Additional copies of The Fresh Voice of Laughter may be purchased by contacting Fresh Publishing, Post Office Box 5020, Woodland Park, Colorado, 80866, or call 1-800-687-6077.